Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Becoming a Family-Focused System, Building a Culture to Partner with Families conference call. Today's conference is being recorded, and at this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Chris King. Please go ahead. Thank you. I will now turn it over to our facilitator today, Jennifer Marcelli. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, my name is Jennifer Marcelli. I am the Program Area Manager for Foster Care with the Capacity Building Center for State. Um, I just wanted to um, let you all know who you're going to be hearing from today. You have Michelle Amon from Kentucky Department for Community-Based Services, and she has over 14 years of experience working in child welfare. She's the Assistant Director of the Kentucky Sobriety Treatment and Recovery Team. Um, and has assisted in implementation of the model and presents nationally and regionally on best practices for child welfare involved families impacted by parental substance use. We also have Jennifer Warren from the Kentucky Department for Community-Based Services, and she has over 19 years of experience working in child welfare. She is currently an executive advisor in the Department for Community-Based Services Commissioner's Office and is the department's child welfare transformation lead. And we're also very lucky today to also have Brandon Schlosser, who is our young adult consultant working with the Capacity Building Center for State. Um, next, I just want to let you all know what you're going to be hearing today. Um, in a moment, I'm going to go over the objectives for our event, um, and then you're going to hear about the transformation project. Um, you're going to um, hear about um, the shift of culture change for family engagement. Um, then our presenters are going to talk about the START program. Um, we're going to um, give some information on um, some resources from the Capacity Building Center for States called the Becoming a Family Focused System Series. Um, and then we'll also have time um, at the end for a question and answer session. So please, throughout today's um, presentation, um, type into the chat any questions that you have for the presenters, um, and we will be able to do that at the end of the event. And then finally, just to go over um, our objectives for today, um, for you all to be able to identify strategies for building an organizational culture to engage and collaborate with families effectively and consistently. Um, to also be able to identify critical strategies for building and sustaining an organizational, organizational culture and climate that supports family engagement at all levels of child welfare. And then again, to increase your awareness at some of the resources that the center can provide in this area. With that, I am going to turn it over to Jennifer Warren to get us going. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jennifer Warren, and I'm going to talk to you about our overall child welfare transformation here in Kentucky, which we consider a call to action. Uh, we understand that on the other side of every decision that we make, every policy that is implemented in every law that is passed, there's a child or a family that will either feel the benefit or the consequence of that decision. And on the next slide, you will see um, this is a graphic and it's fairly busy. And this is really just a glance. I'm not going to go over every single piece of, of this graph, but what I do want to point out is um, it's the picture of what we are doing here in Kentucky. Child welfare transformation is really the overarching framework that's supporting uh, the department's goal for systems-wide improvement and to become a highly effective, efficient child welfare agency. As you can see, it encompasses a lot of initiatives. Um, those are levers for, our, again, that, that we want as systems-wide transformation. It, is, it includes some fiscal modernization, state legislative activities, and some regulatory initiatives, federal compliance, and implementation of best practices. And just a little bit of history around this. Uh, about in, in April of 2018, we had, like all states, soaring caseloads, averages of, of 30. In some areas, we had workers that had 80 cases or more to their name, um, staffing shortages, an embattled front line like everyone else, and very close to about 10,000 children in out-of-home out care. So our system was very overwhelmed. So DCBS um, implemented a comprehensive project management structure so that we could begin to lift some of our transformation efforts. 
And we had nine work groups. You can see that. Those are the dark blue. I won't go into all of those. The, those work groups functioned as really like think tanks and where we, we developed strategies and um, we had community partners at the table. And, and so we, through that, we had about 52 transformational strategies that we have listed over the last um, year to 16 months. And uh, as part of that, we identified three priority goals that we wanted to focus on, that we really wanted to lift. And you can see those. They're not in rank order, but they um, safely reduce the number of children entering out-of-home care, improve timeliness to appropriate permanency. That's a key word for us. We want that permanency to be appropriate. And of course, to reduce our staff caseloads. And these are, these are standalone, but they all influence each other. And so um, we're not finished. We're, we've, we're about 16 months into this work, and we have entered phase two. And um, we're going to be lifting some different work groups around judicial engage, engagement and um, looking at primary, secondary prevention work and emphasis on recovery and resilience by biological parents and ultimately, we're really transforming into becoming a more data-informed and outcome-driven agency. The nine child welfare transformation workgroups include workforce supports, transition-aged youth, prevention supports, relative placement support, fiscal modernization, permanency, service region implementation, and IT. Core strategies include a culture of safety, aligned service array, shared focus on outcomes, and a collaborative practice model. Arrows point from Uniting Kentucky text at the top of the slide down to the bottom, which reads CQI slash quality assurance. Um, so let's talk about, in the next slide, you'll see we're going to talk about some key features of the transformation effort. And this is um, our foundation of, of, of shifting our culture. And so if you would go to stakeholder engagement slide. So from the beginning, it's very important that um, we, that I talk about this. From, from the beginning, our stakeholders have been involved. Um, they've been at the table. We've, we've, we brought them in early, early on. And uh, we had, you can see here, this is a picture of Josh Deegan. He is a former foster youth with the Voices of, of the Commonwealth. And that's an advisory group of um, former foster youth here in Kentucky. And those, those youth had um, membership on at least three or four of our work groups, but they also met one-on-one -on -one with our commissioner. And one thing that we really want to emphasize here is that the youth at the table, they weren't a token voice. They were actually heard. We engaged them um, and, and asked them to advocate, and we worked with them, and they were a participant. This is a picture of, of Josh, and he's sitting at the table um, advocating for the, the passage of the Foster Youth Bill of Rights, which was House Bill 158, and it was just recently passed. The other important piece that we brought youth on board to have a conversation about is um, listing our new independent living program called Kentucky Rise. They also reviewed the curriculum called LIFT, and they actually gave feedback, told us what was, what's not working. And so we've, they've been integral into this part of, of that conversation, and we also had parent mentors come alongside of us in, in a couple of our work groups. And we have a foster parent, relative caregivers. They've had membership. It's been really critical to have those stakeholders. And then we've had sister agencies as, as well. So, um, And then moving forward in phase two, we'll be adding additional mentors to be part of some of the other work groups. And on the next slide, um, here was a critical piece for us as well, is um, a commitment from our leadership from the very beginning. Literally from the governor to the first lady, um, cabinet and executive leadership, they have supported our transformation efforts 
from the very beginning, our cabinet secretary, Adam Meyer, his team and, and him personally, they were at the table. They would attend our work groups. They would offer insight and, and they were they were at the table to contribute and would encourage us, think outside the box. Kentucky had a, an opportunity to radically transform its system and our cabinet secretary was at the table and um, he, he was very supportive of that. And of course, our commissioner, Eric Clark, you can see pictures of, of him here in this slide. He participates, he's very involved. He's, uh, he's probably been to 99% of the meetings. If, if he can get to them, he's at the table and urging us to you know, think outside the box. And again, he leads by example, he supports this work. He's actually engaged with field staff. He's out in the region talking to um, all you know, staff at every level. And he's done some ride along. He's very committed to um, hearing the voices in our agency and, and our stakeholders. Um, I mentioned a minute ago, or just a second ago, that he went on ride-alongs with a couple of our workers, and he was able to really walk into a home with and see what our staff encounter every day, and, and he was deeply impacted by those experiences, and, and he is out there advocating for change for us, but again, he's, he's very supportive, and that is the, the commitment of leadership and, and urging us to, uh, and, and giving us permission to make changes and strategize, that has been key. The slide features three staff photos and two photos of Eric Clark presenting in front of a group. Um, so our commissioner, he's very committed, and uh, we wanted, as part of this presentation, we wanted to really talk about our movement, um, since we're talking about culture, and we really wanted to talk about the culture of safety for our staff and how that we are moving into that. And you'll see on the next slide, um, that culture of safety, this, this involves shifting from a reactive culture of fear, blame, and intimidation to a responsive culture. And we all, I think, can probably agree that the majority of child welfare sits in that reactive culture. And um, workers often are driven, their decision making is driven by fear. They don't want to be blamed. They don't want to be held accountable. So um, this is a key transformational strategy for us. And we have um, brought in the initial, all of our leadership from the top down, our secretary's office has been trained in this. It's starting to branch out into some sister agencies. But this is the one strategy that we feel like, um, in addition to some of the other work that we're doing, that will have the, one of the most significant impacts on our priority outcomes. So at the end of the day, if we stabilize our workforce and they feel safe in their decision making, then they are free to do that. They know they're not going to be blamed. And so we're early on in that implementation. And what culture safety does, it, it blends the safety science that's used in the airline, healthcare, other high-risk industries. You may be familiar with it. And instead of blaming a person for an event that happens where we will have negative outcomes in child welfare, there, there will just always be that. And so if an, if an occurrence happens, they don't blame the worker, the individual, because we understand no one comes to work, no one gets up the middle of, in the morning and says, today I'm going to go to work and I'm going to make a decision that's going to cause a negative outcome. So um, we're moving in this direction and, and we've had the majority of our leadership, our judges and, and our administrative office of courts, they are engaged in this. We've, we've introduced them to the, the collaborative safety agency that, that we are working with, at the end of the day, what the culture of safety does is it holds the system accountable. It's a trauma-informed lens, and we really feel, we've seen in other states that their caseloads have reduced, they're retaining staff, and their caseloads are reducing, so we're really excited about um, this moving forward, and we really we just, we're, we're at the place, like every other state, 
where we have to begin to have a different conversation. Workers are not the ones who are causing trauma to children in, 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 in physical um, death. They don't come to work with those intentions. So we are moving away from a reactive culture of fear and blame. And on the next slide, we're redefining child welfare for Kentucky. For a long time, we are, we are the lead agency, of course, but we're not the child welfare system. And so we're redefining that child welfare belongs to all of us. And this is a picture, again, it's somewhat busy, but when we're talking to our community partners, we're engaged with staff, this is the conversation that we are starting to have. We want to lead the way in, in, in becoming a child welfare system that's moving into a 21st century away from the practices of the 60s and the 70s where the first response is a removal, but that we're um, really looking at engaging at the community level and having that conversation that um, we want children to be in community-based settings with family, that's whether it's biological kin and adoptive family, Clearly, we would um, reunification would be the first option there. So we, um, this is our conversation, and it's essential. We're in front of legislators. It's essential too for the government, all three branches, to um, believe this, to believe that each child is worthy and deserves a safe and, and nurturing family. So in the coming months and years, as we're um, moving and embedding our transformation work in, um, into everyday practice. Our message is that if we collectively do this correctly, there will ultimately be a greater return on investment, on long-term costs, and avoidance by virtue of, of the fact that families are, are, and children are together and they are thriving. So as we're moving into phase two of our transformation work, um, just to summarize, it really does involve becoming a data-informed system that will inform the strategies as we move forward, embedding that into our CQI and quality assurance processes. Uh, we want to sustain the gains that we have made, and, and we want to be responsive to the agencies. The, the strategies that we have in place today, just like yesterday, the strategies that we had in place, they're not working today. So really um, providing a structure for ongoing change is um, how, we are, how we are moving forward. So we are restructuring our CQI to be more robust and to help facilitate that conversation at, our, at, our, um, at all levels of the agency. A diagram on the slide features blue arrows circling connected green dots and a larger green dot in the center. Clockwise from the top, the blue arrows point to schools, courts, and the juvenile justice system, then treatment and recovery programs, then public health, then mental and behavioral health, and lastly, faith-based community. The six green dots include, clockwise from the top, prevention services, kinship and relative placements, foster care, public and private, reunification, adoption, and post-adoption supports. The middle dot reads, family and child. So Michelle, that concludes my um, presentation. I'm gonna turn this over to Michelle Almond. Great, thank you so much. Oh. Hello everyone. So again, my name is Michelle Almond and I'm the Assistant Director for START. And again, START stands for Sobriety Treatment and Recovery Team. Really an integral part of our program um, is the use of peer supports. And so I wanted to kind of just start with a polling question if we could. Now, tell us your experience with having a peer support program in your system, whether that's no experience at all, um, or if there's a new program that's begun, or you might have a lot of experience with it. I just kind of want to get an idea of who our audience is here and what that could look like. I've also got a short answer question that I'd like to go into. So with your experience, what challenges or barriers have you encountered in trying to implement peer support programs in your jurisdiction? And so the use of peer supports has become 
pretty widely spread, especially in our behavioral health providers. So I'm interested to see if there's been any challenges that you all have faced. And we're going to talk through those as we kind of go through this presentation here. Funding, absolutely. Struggle in ensuring peer supports keep their sobriety through maintaining their recovery. It's very difficult for, um, we're asking our peer supports to not only live in their recovery, but also work in their recovery. And we have to acknowledge that. So that can be quite, quite difficult. So we really need to talk through all of those. Recruitment has definitely been an issue in those rural areas. We're, we're going to talk about that, actually. That's, this is great information. How to pay the peer supports. So again, where that comes with the funding. Wonderful. And so I'm really seeing um, kind of that spread, but a lot of people are not having a lot of personal experience with the peer support. So this will be some really good conversation, I think, to have. Because START is one of these transformation efforts that Kentucky actually began earlier on in 2007. Polling results. For the audience request, tell us about your experience with having a peer support program in your system. 33.3% responded, no experience at all. 40.7% responded, a little experience. 9.26% responded, have just started a new program. 14.8% responded, have had a program for a while now. And 1.85% responded, not sure. So if we can kind of go back to our slides. Thank you. And so as I mentioned, the use of peer supports has become quite widespread in our behavioral health providers. But what makes STAR a little bit different is the use of them in our child welfare system. And so just to give a little history on START, it actually began in the Cleveland, Ohio area in the 1990s at what was really the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. So they were seeing a lot of kids coming into out-of-home care, and they wanted to look at some other options. And so as you just heard from Jennifer, we have a ton of kids coming into out-of-home care now as well in Kentucky. And so we brought um, this planning over into Kentucky in 2006 and then began taking cases in 2007. We've implemented in eight different counties. And just to kind of give you an idea, we are widespread, but um, we are in Campbell, Kenton, and Boone counties, which is right across the river from Cincinnati. We're in some more urban areas, such as Jefferson County, which is Louisville, and in Fayette, which is Lexington. We're also in the eastern part of the state in Boyd County, which is Ashland, Kentucky. And we're in the western part of the state, which is um, in Davis County, which is Owensboro. Now, we did implement a site in Martin County, and that was in the far eastern part of Kentucky. And that is um, more Appalachian area. And we weren't able to maintain long term a full site there, but we continue to have some start strategies being utilized. It's also been implemented in parts of Indiana and North Carolina, and most recently in Maryland. And then it's also been piloted in the Bronx, New York, and parts of Georgia. So what exactly is START? It's a specialized ongoing child welfare program. We really combine best practices within the child welfare system, the courts, our behavioral health providers, all trying to work together with these mutual clients to obtain and maintain their sobriety and recovery, but while trying to keep the children in the home with the parents if safely possible. So it really needs to be initiated by the CPS system, that Child Protective Service system. We foster that integration among the child welfare system, substance use services, the courts, our community partners, and our sobriety supports. They're really bridging those differences in a professional perspective. And we have been recognized on the CEBC as a program that's promising research and scientific evidence. CEBC stands for? California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse for Child Welfare. We do serve families that have at least one child in the home between the ages of zero and five. So they can have older children in the home as well, but they have to have at least one small child. We focus on quick access to assessments and treatment services. And we do that really by partnering with our community partners that offer the treatment services. Because we're in child welfare, we need to work with our agencies outside who offer those treatments. 
and really communicating with one another and doing some cross-training, understanding where each entity is coming from. And it's really just a different approach to looking at substance use disorder and working with those clients who are struggling with addiction. So what are our overall goals to start? We do want to prevent and or decrease foster care entries, and we are a child welfare agency. We ultimately want to reduce that recurrence of child maltreatment. We want to provide quick and timely access to substance use treatments, ultimately improving that treatment completion rate, which affects the parental sobriety. We want to make sure that we're building protective parenting capacities that are going to affect child permanency. We want to make sure that we're providing comprehensive support to ensure family stability and self-sufficiency to the children and their entire family unit. We also want to increase that capacity to address co-occurring substance use and child maltreatment and really begin to change that culture within the CPS system, that no more business as usual mentality. So really kind of looking at how we can do better, how we can all work together, simply because this is the way we've always done things, doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way to continue to move forward. So some of the essential elements to our program, we do pair a child welfare social worker up with what's called a family mentor. I'll go into a little bit more detail about the family mentors here in just a moment. But we pair them up and we call them a dyad. They're co-located under a child welfare supervisor in the child welfare agency, and they share a cap caseload of up to 15 cases. So really, each family that comes involved with START, they have an entire team that's surrounding them. And part of that team, that includes the social worker, the mentor, the supervisor, the START service coordinator who's going to get them through sort treatment services and really coordinate each of those, any service providers and community partners that the family might be involved with, as well as the court personnel. So really that entire group of individuals surrounding this family, adding wraparound services to make sure that everybody's being protected and being served. We have a pretty rapid timeline that we use to quickly identify these families and then get them engaged into treatment services. We have our minimum work guidelines through START, and that includes at least weekly home visits by the social worker and the family mentor. And so um, we really want to have some one-on-one -on -one attention. It's an, that increased oversight, making sure that we know what's going on with that family, what barriers they're facing, and what's going well for them. And then it's an overall non-punitive approach. So not just focusing on what hasn't worked well for the family, but really talking about and acknowledging what are their strengths and then building on those strengths to make sure that we can help move them forward in their case plan and their court orders. So going into more detail about that family mentor, it's someone who is in long-term recovery. We ask that they have at least three years of sobriety when they come to work for us. And then also are looking for that personal CPS experience, or at least that sensitization of knowing and understanding what it's like to parent during your addiction and during that early recovery. And so this is something really important to consider, that transition from being a recipient of the child welfare services to now becoming a member of that team and working for the agency. So we have to even look at that person may have received services at that specific child welfare office or may have even been served by that particular team. And so this is especially true in more of the rural areas. So in implementing at a new site, this is something that we really need to explore. Not only explore with the family mentor applicant, so we definitely want to make sure that we're processing that with them during that interview process of how are their feelings about the agency now. So we know that there was possibly some, some negative feelings in the beginning during their case that they had open, however long ago that was. And we need to acknowledge that, that that was normal. There could be some frustrations or fear. But how are they feeling about working for this agency now? Have they processed through that? Do they see the need for the agency to be involved during that initial crisis period? And have they worked through all of that? But then we also want to explore that with members of the team and others in that office. 
So some workers may be really uncomfortable working with somebody who used to be a former client of the agency, and now that's their coworker whose office is down the hall. So what we've actually seen is that even in those sites where there was some hesitancy, the, the staff there actually then began to see the mentors as a resource. So they begin to see that office culture change, and it really challenged our language that we had, that we use. It challenged how we view clients, how addiction might be viewed, really challenging that stigma. So not only just within our agency, but within the courts, and then also with our outside agencies that we tend to work closely with. So we have a qualitative study in START, and it's called Like a Marriage, and that's often how we refer to our dyads. And it really showed the positive impact that our family mentors have on our teams and how working closely with the family mentor increased the social workers' empathy that they had for their clients, which ultimately led to better services. So this began to spread to other social workers outside of the START team, especially those of the investigative social workers and the family team meeting facilitators. So if you can kind of think about investigative workers in the child welfare system, May, don't, may have never seen what recovery looks like. Because they're getting involved during that initial crisis period, maybe getting them connected with certain resources or treatment services, and then moving them right along to ongoing services. So it's very likely that they've never seen that recovery. They don't know what that could look like. And it's very fearful to see that now a previous client is working in this agency. So that's something that you really want to talk through. Give them that opportunity to express that and then discuss what the value could be of seeing that other side and bringing family mentors or those peer supports into your agency and hearing from others. So shared decision making is another important strategy that we utilize and start. We hold regular family team meetings. And what we mean by that is we're bringing everybody to the table. We want to see the family, the start team, including the supervisor, the worker, the mentor, any community partners that are involved with the family, and then also the family supports, whoever they want to bring to the table, those sober support. And we say nothing about me without me. So no secrets, no surprises. So I'm sure a lot of you may feel very similar to me in that it doesn't feel very comfortable to think about somebody coming in to the room with a pre-made plan of something that myself or my family will have to do and they're just asking me simply to sign it, and I didn't have any input in that. That doesn't feel very good. That doesn't feel right. Who else to be an expert on my family than me? So we really want to start looking at things about asking the family, what, it, what do you see as your strengths? What do you think will work for your family? What are you willing to do? What have you tried that hasn't worked? And really kind of opening this, that communication to figure out, how can we all work together? I want to hear from the sober support systems that the family has brought forward. I want to hear from the community agencies that they are coming to the table. They may have additional resources that can help us keep these children safe and ultimately helping move these families into the recovery networks that we need. So what do we all want to be communicating together? So some of our sites have been utilizing this strategy when we implement CERT. So that part wasn't such a significant change for them. However, some of the sites, this is a brand new way of thinking and a brand new way of really making those decisions, especially around the potential child removal. So the idea of discussing concerns with the family present at the family team meeting was really challenging for some of those investigative workers. And I've had an opportunity to sit in on meetings where after we develop that plan with the family and they've already left the building, the investigative worker came up to myself and the rest of the START team with additional concerns that we hadn't had an opportunity to talk through with the family. So you can kind of see where that plan we just developed might not be appropriate any longer based upon these new concerns. We would have had an opportunity to talk through them with the family. What led to that concern? Can they explain what's going on? What services and resources could we have implemented for that family to address that concern? And so really, was that a good use of our time to be talking about things and not talking about the elephant in the room until after the family had left? 
I've also seen where investigative workers may come in with a, a preset agenda. Um, this is what my supervisor um, has given me permission to discuss today, and this is the plan that we're comfortable implementing. But we really need to kind of open that communication and be comfortable with live decision making. If we have additional people at the table that may be able to offer supports to the family, then we really want to be considering those options. So we should be making those decisions based off of the information that's being provided to us at that moment with all of the resources in mind. And so that's really kind of incorporating everybody. And that, that's a difficult challenge for people, um, but this is a new way of thinking, that live decision making. But it's really helpful, and we're all kind of there brainstorming ideas and really talking through any of those barriers. So one of our sites experienced some challenges in these areas. And so we began to engage the staff in those discussions, in those discussions about this and engage the investigative leadership through ensuring their participation in these family team meetings. And we also brought them to the table in what we call a monthly steering meeting. This is where we kind of discussed our concerns openly. We reviewed early cases that came in. And then we hired a facilitator through our local community mental health center to assist in guiding those meetings. And we really began to get some positive feedback from our investigative staff and those supervisors on how those meetings were going. They were feeling much more comfortable and seeing a lot of success and saying, wow, we really can try to keep these kids in the home. We felt very comfortable with the secure safety plan that we developed all together. So through our research over the years, we've seen the spreading of the practice in regions sometime after SARS implemented. So all of our counties now have implemented a utilization review process as a formal consultation when a child's at risk of removal. And this involves regional specialists and the regional leadership. And it's done whenever a facilitated family team meeting cannot be held prior to a removal. So we begin to see a shift in our counties with START that they're now reporting an increased focus on considering all in-home options before the removal occurs. So this shift has really been helpful in some areas where this is a barrier from the CPS end and the court end, especially as we move into family first. And so we're now hearing from staff they're very excited about family first and that increased family preservation resources. So we have had a rigorous program evaluation since we implemented it in 2007. It's considered an empowerment evaluation as there's a close connection between evaluation and program, which has been so important. So our evaluation team reviews and then they present our fidelity data consistently to leadership and our direct line staff at each site as well as across sites. And so this really enables us to continue to assess our strengths as well as our challenge areas, and for staff to share those experiences and strategies across sites to ultimately improve services. And then additionally, it provides us with, uh, out, with our outcome updates. An empowerment evaluation is an approach to gathering, analyzing, and using data about a program and its outcome that actively involves key stakeholders in the community in all aspects of the evaluation process and that promotes evaluation as a key strategy for empowering communities to engage in systems change. So just to give an overview of what our outcomes look like, we have nearly double the sobriety rate for women in our program. Children in START are about half as likely to enter into foster care. At case closure, over 75% of our START kids remain with or were reunified with their parents. And then for every dollar spent on START, we save about $2.22 in the offset of foster care costs. So that's just kind of a quick um, outcomes overview of that program. And so I wanted to just finish up maybe with another polling question here. So in your experience, what have been the benefits of having a peer support program in your agency? So we talked about those barriers and challenges. What, if any, benefits have you all been able to see? Yes, absolutely, that buy-in factor. That is critical. Aren't they more willing to complete that case plan if they feel like they had some input? Absolutely. And our family mentors, our peer supports, really assist with that buy-in and that early engagement. 
as you can probably imagine, it's, it's very difficult to walk into a room full of either social workers or other professionals and feeling like they don't, you have no idea what I've gone through or what I'm looking at right now. And to some extent, they're often right. But that family mentor can step in and say, but I do. I understand. They have that kind of been there, done that mentality, right? Family definitely feels more supported. They're willing to open up and discuss. So our family mentors help with transportation early on in that case. And so um, that being in that car, it, it's not this glorified taxi driver. It's really helping with that engagement. Um, you always talk about if you have kids, that's the one time that you can really open up is getting them to talk in the car, right? It feels a little bit less invasive. You don't necessarily need to be staring at each other. And so the client begins to open up. The family mentor is sharing their story. And they're really, all they're doing is promoting that engagement. Calm nerves, absolutely. Helping the client to understand. It really challenges our language. Um, so we, <laughs> cabinet employees, I feel we tend to talk in code sometimes. We have a lot of acronyms. And so our family mentors will often kind of challenge us to say, slow it down for a minute. What does that mean? Let's break it down for the family and make sure that they understand. And that's so important because it is their case. And we want to make sure that we're meeting the client where they're at. Strength in numbers, absolutely. Family's voice needs to be heard. These are great things, absolutely. I appreciate the involvement and the participation. All right, I think now we're going to transfer over to Jennifer Marcelli. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so in a moment, we will be able to head into our question and answer. So please, if you have any questions for the presenters, go ahead and type them in, in your chat. Um, I wanted to go over some resources that the center has to support you all in this area. Um, as we've talked about today, we know a healthy innovative agency culture that's aligned with agency climate can play a significant role in the success of partnerships and change initiatives designed to meet the families, um, the needs of families, youth, and children. And we've developed the Becoming a Family Focused System. Um, it's a collection of user-friendly resources that are designed to help teams assess and amplify positive agency culture and climate, identify areas that need attention, um, and implement strategies to bring about meaningful and sustainable improvements. And agencies can use these resources to assess their culture and climate, find strategies for improvement, engage staff partners and stakeholders with podcasts and animated videos, enhance existing training programs, um, and you can use these resources to build that foundational knowledge about culture and climate, the examples of real life strategies, and to spark conversation with staff and stakeholders. And I wanted to go into a little bit more detail on some of these products. So um, first we have um, the Assessing Culture and Climate, and this provides foundational information and step-by-step -step guidance for assessing how agency culture and climate um, can support family engagement, continuity of relationships, and collaborative development of services to meet families' needs, much like we talked about today. And managers can use this brief to learn about basic concepts, form a team, choose or develop assessment tools, conduct an assessment, and analyze the results. The next product is Strategies for Building a Culture of Service Collaboration. Um, and this presents strategies to establish support and reinforce culture and climate for collaborative development of a service array that is responsive to families and youth. Managers can adapt strategies and examples from this publication to improve specific areas of culture influencing service array identified in the assessment. And then we also have the strategies for building a culture to partner with families. Um, and this offers strategies to establish support and reinforce agency culture and climate that's supportive of a family engagement and the continuity of relationships for children in care. And managers can adapt these strategies and examples from the publication to improve specific areas of culture influencing family engagement and continuity of relationships that are also identified in the assessment. So um, next, we're really excited. These, these products are the next two products that I'm going to talk about are um, going to come out next month. Um, and first, we have um, 
the How We Partner with the Community to Improve Service Options podcast series. Um, and this will highlight real stories from the field, actually Kentucky is highlighted um, in this series, about how agencies are changing um, organizational culture from a compliance approach for procuring services towards collaborative development of a service array that's responsive to families and youth. And staff and stakeholders will identify with the challenges and barriers these agencies face and can be inspired by their success. And we are going to have five episodes that are made from interviews conducted with child welfare agencies in Kentucky, as I mentioned, um, and also in um, D.C. And those five episodes, um, the first one highlights the framework for change in the leadership role. The second episode um, highlights starting and sustaining collaborative partnerships. The third episode is about including family, youth, and community voice at the system level. The fourth episode is around shifting to a family-focused organizational culture. Um, and the fifth episode is about data sharing for planning and decision making. So we're excited about that podcast coming out um, again next month. And then we also um, have another um, digital product that's um, animated video series, and it's called How We Become a Family-Friendly Agency. And this follows the experience of child welfare staff, stakeholders, and family leaders as they implement strategies to shift the culture and climate around family engagement and continuity of relationships. And there's five animated videos that tell the story of that agency's journey as it moves from a compliance-oriented defensive culture toward a more constructive organizational culture that emphasizes performance, support, and innovation. And program managers can use the video series to spark conversations with staff and stakeholders about assessing and changing agency culture and climate to really supporting work in partnership with families. So the first episode is called Walking the Talk, and that uncovers staff attitudes and beliefs that stand in the way of becoming family focused. In episode one, Francie, who's the agency's foster care program manager, has a conversation with two new caseworkers and discovers a disconnect between what the agency promotes through its vision and mission and what's actually happening in practice. And then in episode two, um, it's titled Listening to Staff and Families, and it describes strategies to change staff attitudes, engage families in developing their case plans, and keep children in foster care connected with their families and their community. And in this episode, Rosa, who's a parent partner, shows how she joined the team, what she does in her role, and how the work group is helping the agency improve the support and services provided to families. Episode three talks about supporting families and kin, um, and it presents strategies to promote engagement and support of families and kin, and describes the importance of continuous feedback. Um, in this episode, we are introduced to Stephen, the kinship navigator, um, and he shares how he joins the team, what he does in his role, and what the work group is doing to help the agency improve the support and services provided to families. And then in episode four, um, we highlight partnering with the courts, which we know is very important when we're looking at engaging families and shifting culture. And it shows strategies for child welfare staff to work with the court system to support family involvement. And we hear from Joe, who's the court improvement program lead, and he talks about his experience on the work group and the corresponding changes made in the court system to improve the support and services providing, provided to families. And then finally, in episode five, it's really around reinforcing the changes that have happened, um, and it describes practices that embed and sustain changes in organizational culture. In this final episode, um, the caseworkers, Tyler, Angela, and Lawrence, and the program manager, Francie, talk about all of the changes over that past year um, and how that has shifted the culture to better support families. So we're really excited about that digital series as well. Um, and then finally, there's going to be one additional product added to this um, as well, which is Improving Culture Begins with Leaders. And that provides um, an at-a-glance look at the critical role that leadership plays in creating and sustaining positive organizational culture. Um, and you can read this tip sheet to learn about strategies to initiate, promote, and sustain improved organizational culture through adaptive leadership and modeling collaboration. Um, and you can share it with leadership to spark discussion around supporting that positive change throughout your agency. So again, those first three products are available on our website now. Um, and the last three that I talked about will be available next month. So we hope you go and take a look um, and, and utilize these in the work that you're doing. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Brandon, um, who is going to um, get us going with our question and answer.
Hey everyone, uh, my name is Brandon Schlosser. I'm a young adult consultant with the Capacity Building Center for States. Um, so first, I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to attend this event. Um, if you have any questions or want to know more about anything that you've seen or heard, feel free to type that out in the participant chat and we can get those questions answered for you. Um, if we cannot get to your question, we can connect with you at a later time. Um, so we already have some questions flowing in. So this first one, uh, how does developing a culture for collaborative service array with a system and partner agencies, for example, sharing similar goals and focusing on family, support a systemic shift toward prevention services? Uh, Michelle or Jennifer, do you have anything to say about that one? Yeah, I think that bringing families to the table at every level is important to really promote that shift. And so start using family mentors to help with engagement of our clients and to really get that buy-in on the frontline level. So we're able to kind of look at and utilize their strengths in moving forward to look at prevention services. But I think we also need to consider parents and youth being at the table at the time that policies are developed and when decisions are being made. I think it's also important to get feedback from frontline staff as they're the ones that will be directly providing the services and from the families who will ultimately be impacted by these decisions. And I think that will really help alleviate some of the barriers along the way. We need to demonstrate that we respect the family's voice, that that voice is important, and that needs to be embraced from not only a leadership level but at every level. And then it tends to be less of a shift to value that family's voice from the beginning of the case when you're really looking at those preventative efforts all the way through to the end when you're getting towards permanency. Great. Thank you. Yes, uh, family and youth voice is very powerful. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to our second question, uh, what engagement strategies have brought youth to the table, and what strategies are helping to keep them engaged? I believe this one is good for Jennifer. Okay. Um, the first thing that I would say is from a systems perspective, the big picture, we, our project management structure really fostered that approach, and so it allowed us, it gave us the framework to not just include them in a, it, we had a transition age youth work group, and they had membership on that, but we also included them in our out-of-home care work, um, the, some of those work groups, and they were on a permanency work group, so they were informing us from their perspective. We also include, um, from the Voices of the Commonwealth, our youth advocacy group, they are included in our foster parent training. So they have a time that they will come and talk during foster parent training about how important it is, um, what, what, it, what they are like, what, um, and they normalize the youth. Um, you have folks that are afraid sometimes to have um, older children in their home, and so they really bring a different level of information, and we have seen really good results from that. So they are part of our training. The other thing that we did um, recently over the last couple of months, we are, uh, you may or may not know this, Kentucky will be implementing in October the Family First Services, a Family First Prevention Services Act. And we have just recently finished all of our forms. We went to nine regions. Uh, we, have, we have nine regions, and we went to all of them. And we had a youth speak at every one of those forms when um, he was designated for that, um, those forms. And he was phenomenal. The, the, the level of um, emotion and just raw information that he brought about what his experience experience was and how if there could have just been services on the front end to maybe some of the trauma that he encountered um, in foster care because that was very real for him. So um, that, that conversation has really, uh, you can, if, if you are on Facebook, we have um, a Facebook site. It's a, a Facebook page is called Kentucky Department for Community-Based Services, and some of those face, some of those forums were recorded live, and you can hear him. His name is Chris Hagen, 
And the other thing in phase two, moving forward to keep them engaged and to keep their voice at the table is um, we merged our stakeholder advisory group and our sponsors, and we created a strategic partnership work group that will be um, moving forward. They will act as an advisory for our agency and the work that we're doing. And the Voices of the Commonwealth have membership on that work group. Thank you. It sounds like you have a lot of great strategies. Um, <clears throat> So the third question, uh, for those jurisdictions that are just starting down this path to engage youth and families in their system process, uh, what suggestions would you have about where to start? This can go to either Michelle or Jennifer, I think. So I think really just to kind of piggyback off of what Jennifer was just saying with the last question, and I, we have to go into that buy-in, but one of the options um, could be to begin with a survey to see where your staff currently are with their practices, what are they currently doing with their clients, and then what are they open to? Because you may find out that there's a need for more training that needs to be put in place, or at least more discussions to be had to understand the staff's comfort levels. Um, and as what Jennifer was just saying, inviting a parent representative or a youth representative to this planning meeting, their work groups. You know, folks may initially have some hesitancy about this, but really kind of taking the opportunity to address those concerns, um, talk through the value of what that could bring. It can be really difficult for us to hear that we may not have done the best job with families in the past, but we can come to it with a new perspective of learning from this, really valuing the families who are sharing their experience. And I think ultimately that will help us grow in this shift to truly integrating those families into that decision making. And if I could, this is Jennifer. I would also add, uh, from a systems perspective, the big picture, your leadership has to lead that. They have to, um, your leadership has to buy in. And what, what we found very helpful, uh, you start by looking at your data. What, where do you know? You have to understand your system. And what we did not want to do was, if I could use this, we didn't want to spitball and just start so we we knew where we um, we looked at our data we understood what our challenges were and so our the project management structure and those work groups were built around that and the other thing that I would say is embed this into your CQI process if, if you can't um, do a, a project management type structure and, and, and if you're a supervisor or you're um, at the local level, if you have a CQI process in your agency, that's the greatest place to start because you can just invite them to become part of the conversation. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it, uh, the, so we have some more participant questions. Um, the first one is for Michelle Hansford. Uh, how would a state work to have START implemented? I think this one is good for Michelle. Yeah, so the purveyor of our program start is actually Children and Family Futures. So your state's leadership can just contact them directly and begin that process. We do have a start manual, um, so they would be providing you that oversight and that consultation on how to begin. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, this next one is from Rachel Thomas. I'm sorry, from Libby Foster. Um, how big are the counties that have implemented START? Do you have other cases that are done the quote-unquote traditional way? Yeah, so I think it's really kind of spread. We have, um, as I was mentioning, kind of the different sites that we have across the state. There are larger urban areas, um, even into a little bit more rural areas. And so at each of our sites where we have START, there are non-START um, investigative and ongoing teams there. And so we really work to partner with those other teams, and the hope is to spread START strategies. And so while you may not be able to have all of the essential elements of START, including that, that rapid timeline and the use of the family mentors and those contracted entities with the behavioral health providers, there are other things that you can use to spread those practices, and including that non-punitive approach and the shared decision making and that early engagement and really that open communication with treatment providers. So 
in all of our sites, they do have that quote unquote traditional way of CPS cases. But it's our hope that we're able to then kind of spread those start strategies throughout. And uh, so we actually have some extensions to that question. Um, so this is also from Libby Foster. How many kids in out-of-home care on average? And also, how many family men mentors do you have? What do you do if they struggle with their sobriety while employed with you? So is the question more about how many children in out-of-home care within the START program or within Kentucky? Uh, that would be a good question. I am getting the idea that it's for Kentucky in general, but uh, if Libby Foster can type up, we have within the county service. Within the county serve. So, um, really, Jennifer may have a little bit more knowledge as to how many children in out of home care overall. I don't know, Jennifer, if you have some of that information. I do, yeah. O overall, okay. in the state of Kentucky, we have 9,660 children in care today. Okay. And so, um, we do have individual county information as to what type of cases. We do run those numbers to see if it can maintain an entire caseload um, for start. Since it is capped, we're looking for um, data and showing that what's substantiated in regards to substance use being that primary issue. Those are the families that we're working with. And so I don't know specifically in, in each of those counties how many children are in out-of-home care. It is less likely um, in the start case, we're about 50% less likely to have children in out-of-home care if they're part of that start model. So I can't answer that piece. As far as how many family mentors we have, <coughs> excuse me, we do have 34 family mentor positions across our state in each of those sites. So that does include some of our vacancies that we have. We're still um, hiring in some of those sites, but 34 altogether. What do we do when we see someone struggling with their sobriety? It's a constant open communication. Um, we really kind of foster that new way of supervision as well, um, of really making sure that the family mentors feel comfortable coming to their supervisor, coming to their leadership, letting them know beforehand um, if they're struggling, if they're feeling overwhelmed, talking through those pieces. As I mentioned before, it can be really challenging that we're asking somebody to live in, in recovery and then also work in recovery. And so that's kind of an, an added challenge. So we make sure that the family mentors feel comfortable discussing that. Um, we, we have those discussions as a previous START supervisor myself. I've had those discussions if somebody needs to take their lunch break to um, go to a, a local meeting, um, a sober support meeting, then we would encourage that because we want to make sure that we're all taking care of ourselves. So really that um, making sure that everybody's communicating with one another. Great. It really sounds like you're working with the people that you serve as part of the team. So that is great. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, our last question so far, at least, um, is uh, from Cherie Huchin. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, what systems do you have in place to ensure a trauma-informed approach in systems you work with? Specifically, what are the non-punitive approaches do you use in oversight to ensure that other systems are using trauma-informed approach? Yeah. That's a great question. And so, you know, with trauma-informed, we, we don't want to be asking what's wrong with you, but more so what's happened to you, right? And so um, part of our leadership team, uh, there are three directors. We have our head director, and then on the assistant director, we also have a clinical director that brings that behavioral health perspective. Um, so myself and the other director are more on the child welfare piece. But we didn't want to forget that behavioral health part, which is so important, because we want to be making sure that we're bridging those gaps between the two entities. And so really our clinical director works very closely with all of our contracted community mental health agencies on what evidence-based practices they're providing, including that trauma-informed information and that, and that evidence. And so we also have, we train all of our staff on the child welfare side and on the behavioral health side in motivational interviewing. And we conduct um, coaching sessions every other month to make sure that we're kind of maintaining that skill and how we're working with our families. Another non-punitive approach that we also have is when we're considering visitation. 
And so we don't want to um, move directly towards stopping that visitation along with if there's a positive drug screen or a return to use. But we're looking at how can we continue that visitation but while keeping the children safe. So if that needs to be supervised or in a particular setting, then we're looking at that as well. We have those same communication or those same discussions with our court system and not just moving towards taking that visitation away as we're looking at that as a right by both the parent and the child to have that contact with their biological families. So just kind of some other non-punitive ways that we're looking at the CPS case. Great, thank you. I hope that that answered your question, Sherry. Um, so we have one more now um, from Nicole Barnes. Uh, what steps have you or are you taking to get court support for the processes you have with the START program? Yes, yeah, so this is a huge part of that buy-in factor, and we start this very early on. Um, we most recently implemented in two of our newer sites in northern Kentucky um, at the end of April of this year. And so well before that, months prior, we were meeting with each of the court systems. That included the judges and the panel of attorneys for each of the judges to make sure we were kind of explaining that process, what our model was about, what we were hoping to see spread in those practices, and really kind of getting that buy-in. Um, it, it is a challenge across the board, I think, to look at things differently of, of not moving um, forward in fear, kind of what Jennifer was explaining before. Um, so making sure that we're listening to those concerns and understanding, um, giving them that opportunity to talk through it. But then, again, also sharing that value, the same thing that you want to be doing with your frontline staff and your agency. Um, some of our sites have implemented what's called a start docket, and it's run just a little bit differently in the fact that they can have those monthly, some of them set up one day a month, where um, they will bring in a couple of cases, a handful of cases, and that's determined by the team um, of which cases will be set. And then it's an opportunity to discuss not just the concerns, if there was a new use, um, or if there's a concern for needing to change placement. But it also gives an opportunity to bring in cases where you're going to talk about positive changes, updating the court to let them know that the parents have completed another phase of treatment, or they've graduated treatment, or they've obtained and maintained their self-sufficiency. So really another way to celebrate those successes. Yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, this is probably the last chance that we have for questions during the webinar. So if you have any more uh, questions, please feel free to type them into the participant chat. We'll wait a few seconds. Um, and, but but uh, don't worry, if you have any more questions, um, after the fact, we can read that to you. <clears throat> All right. All right. Seeing no one typing, I think I will turn it over to Jennifer to close us up for the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon, and thank you so much to our um, presenters for today and for all of your participation. Um, so on the next slide, we just wanted um, to make sure that everybody is aware about our um, Child Welfare Virtual Expo that the center is putting on. Um, we hope you join us. It's on Thursday, September 19th. Um, and this year's theme is around effectiveness in child welfare, our role in improving the lives of children and families. And so for those of you um, who have been to an expo before, we hope you come back. And for those of you that haven't, um, we hope you register and come on. It's a, a day-long virtual conference that you can do from the comfort of your office or your phone. Um, there will be a lot of engaging sessions and opportunities to meet and greet with presenters and your peers. So please check that out. Um, on the, the screen, there is the um, website to register and check out more detail. Register for the Child Welfare Virtual Expo at https colon slash slash capacity dot childwelfare dot gov slash virtual expo. Um, and then also we want to make sure that you all know how to stay connected to the center. 
um, and how um, you can learn when the rest of the Becoming Family Focus Suite comes out um, or other products and, and events that the center has going. So um, if you haven't signed up to get our emails, please do so. Um, on the screen there is um, the link to be able to do that. So please do that. Sign up online at https colon slash slash public dot g o v d e l i v e r y dot com slash accounts slash u s a c f c b c s slash sign up slash one zero nine zero six. Um, and then finally, here is our um, contact information at the center. Um, so as, as Brandon said, if, if there's questions that, that come up later you want to contact us, um, you can do so on the website on your screen. Um, and then finally, we do really appreciate you guys joining. We have an evaluation survey that we um, really hope that you take the time to complete. It really helps provide feedback to us about how we can continue to improve our events. All right. Well, thank you all again for joining us today. Um, we hope you learned a lot of valuable information um, from our presenters, and have a great day. We are at the end of our scheduled time, so we will be finishing this webinar shortly. Feel free to contact us using our website, capacity.childwelfare.gov slash states. That's C-A-P-A-C-I-T-Y dot C-H-I-L-D W-E-L-F-A-R-E dot G-O-V slash S-T-A-P-E-S. You can also contact us by your email address, capacityinfo at icf.com. That's C-A-P-A-C-I-T-Y-I-N-F-O at icf.com. Or by our phone number, 844-222-0272. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.